In the previous episodes, we followed one of the branches of the Silk Road, the main road from Dariali to the fortress town of Khornabuji. This road connected the countries of the North and the South Caucasus. We saw the roads and cities which influenced Georgian economic progress. Of course, the cities, the roads, and the economic prosperity are vitally important for the state. However, the environment in which people live is of no less importance. Today, we will open the door and enter this place of natural wonders. We will step into the environment where Vakhtang Gorgasali and his people lived. Throughout the Ice Age, the pre-existing vegetation in the Caucasus changed almost entirely. Except for separate areas on both coasts, only about 30 square kilometers in the middle of the Caucasus Ridge survived the worldwide glaciation. This territory was protected from cold air masses by the mountains on three sides and warmed by the scorching sun from the south. This small oasis is located in Lagodeki, where there is the same subtropical weather and nature now as it was before the glaciation. It is especially important that this place was not subjected to human influences and is preserved in its original form. The year was 1847. Officers of the Caucasian Regiment of the Russian Army stationed in Poland often visited the family of the local nobleman, Franz Mlokosevich. These officers had formerly served in Lagodeki and told the hosts many stories regarding the diversity of Caucasian nature and Lagodeki in particular. These conversations were attended by the general's 16-year-old son, Ludwig, who hated the military but was interested in botany and zoology. He became so fascinated by remote Lagodeki that he finally moved here and devoted his whole life to the protection, study, and popularization of Lagodeki's nature. Ludwig Mlokosevich became a well-known naturalist throughout Europe, and he used all of his authority to convince members of the Russian Academy of Sciences of the uniqueness of Lagodeki's nature. He made a great contribution to the establishment of the Lagodeki Natural Reserve in 1912. Historian Valery Ogiashvili shows us the former dwelling of Ludwig Mlokosevich, which resembles a small botanical garden. This is the territory of the Lagodeki Natural Reserve. On these four hectares of area, a unique variety of trees was planted by Mlokosevich. He brought them from different parts of the world. His house was somewhere near here. The house burned down in 1945. Basically, Mlokosevich was one of the pioneers who introduced beekeeping to Lagoteki, also tobacco growing, which was introduced in the 19th century. This culture was not known until then. A lot of other plants, for instance, sorghum, were brought to Lagodeki. He cultivated experimental varieties of plants that were not known in Georgia at the time. In the 19th century, there was a mudslide that damaged Lagodeki very much. And so he introduced special tree seedlings that were fast growing and provided protection for the shore. These trees have protected Lagodeki from landslides and mudslides for years. A strange thing that I know about him is that he was only 16 years old when he became obsessed with this place. He had heard something about the Caucasus. I read somewhere that when he was released from his deportation, he went to Warsaw, but he could not stay there because he missed Lagodeki. Yes, he lived in Warsaw for a month because he was banned from returning to the Caucasus as he was suspected of involvement in the uprising here in 1863. With the help of his mother, he managed to return to Lagodeki in a month. He settled here again and spent many years here. 
Was he really a count? Yes, he was a so-called court advisor during the Russian Empire. And he became a forester here? Yes, he was a forester in the Signagi region and later he became a senior forester. He walked here, explored nature and everything that was. A total of 40% of Georgia's wild mammals live in the Lago Deki Natural Reserve. Don't be surprised if you come across a roe deer, deer, camels, pig, tour, bear, or even lynx in the forest. We have an interesting device here. It is a photo trap. If you look closely, you'll notice it. And what is it expected to be? We will most likely see a tour. There will be a roe deer. If we are lucky, we will have shots of a bear or a wolf. In short, these photo traps change the course of animal research. In fact, they serve as a 24-hour watchman standing in the woods. If a warm body passes by, it snaps a photo instantly and shows us the animal world through a different perspective. How often do the batteries need to be changed? They need to be changed every six months or so. Now we'll see six months of photos. We will see the material for six months. It is fascinating to transfer it to the computer. In fact, many such photo traps are installed throughout the area. First, we go to the Ninoskevi waterfall. We have to walk seven to eight kilometers in the forest by the river. We start from the village of Gurganiani, not far from Lago Deki. We have to climb the rocks and wade in the water several times. However, the beautiful nature prevents people from feeling tired. Suddenly, we face an amazing sight. A white waterfall falls from a 40 meter high rock, splashing water everywhere. However, this waterfall is just the beginning of the wonderland of Lago Deki. The next day, Georgi Sulamanidze, director of the Lago Deki Protected Areas Administration, led us to the Lago Deki Skali Canyon. This rather difficult route is closed to tourists and is used for scientific purposes only. Before we follow the riverbed up, we have to walk through the famous beech forest. Georgi, what is the main site in Lago Deki besides the fact that nature is beautiful everywhere? The main attraction of Lago Deki is the pristine forest. In fact, this beech tree is a 300-year-old giant. In these forests, people have never conducted agricultural activities. Never? Never. Rarely would someone come here to collect berries. This does not count as impact. What is important is that this forest represents a benchmark of pristine nature. At the same time, we are in the temperate zone where civilized cities are quite developed. Such a thing as 17,000 hectares of pristine forest cannot be found anywhere on Earth. That is why this is our treasure. It resembles a golden treasure that becomes more valuable as time passes. To rephrase it in popular language, 1,500 years ago, even a few thousand years ago, there was exactly the same environment here, is that right? Precisely. 
For millions of years, as the food chains formed, trees had their place in the ecosystem. This environment stays unchanged because the human influence is minimal here. What tree is this giant? This is the eastern beech tree, which is the main component of our forest and the so-called forest pantry. Its fruit is called buckwheat, and it is used by humans, and it is also special for animals and birds in their preparation for the long winter. The tree has to be 70 years old to start growing buckwheat, so 70 years old? This tree is probably 300 years old. It has witnessed a lot. Perhaps if it were able to communicate, it could reveal many things. Trees can communicate. Perhaps this tree now looks at us and laughs because we have just discovered that trees can communicate and it has so much to tell. Maybe they can feel that we came with good intentions. This forest occupies 17,000 hectares, right? And this wealth has been kept as a natural park. Yes, look at those blackberries here and there is some ivy. It covers a big area, as you may notice. This plant is a kind of liana that has no roots and is attached to the tree. It grows up to 20 to 25 meters. I have a feeling this forest can give people a lot more than wood and firewood, and I think that with the current economic state, it will become the greatest wealth on earth in a hundred years. Indeed, because this resource is, many countries do not have such resources, do they? We can say that this is the case. Nowadays, many scientists come from Germany to see what a natural forest is like. Because in Germany, there is a boom of forest naturalism now, but it is difficult to achieve. They come to see what kind of connections there are and attempt to copy them and to try to make their forest natural. We have it all here. Majestic. Look how cool this is, this plain tree. If it is 300 years old now, it remembers even those trees that are no longer here, right? Of course. It remembers the whole story. It has a memory, of course. Memory is, for example, when a tree is cut down, you can see its annual rings. We can learn a lot about history. We know that in 2020 this tree fell. That is, the growth of its rings ended there. If we start counting down, we will see when it was a drought year. If a forest fire broke out in this place, it will surely be darkened. If there is a narrow distance between the lines, it had a bad period. If the distance between the lines is wide, it was raining that year, and so on. In this way, we can reconstruct a 300-year history. We can see what was going on in this forest for 300 years. It is a very interesting and inspiring story. Well, let's move on. There is no trail in the Lago Dekitskali Canyon. We have to follow the river and climb the rocks. We will walk as long as we can, as there is no particular place we need to reach. It is a magic canyon. We decided to turn around next to the curve. However, we saw such beautiful scenery in front of us that we went on and on from one curve to another. The canyon is lined on both sides by high cliffs covered with green lianas from which water drips. The sun's rays hardly ever reach the bottom of the canyon. Noise and water sprays seem to obscure our voice and sense of smell, and the prey that is here pays less attention to us.
The river is icy cold and the air is warm and humid as in the subtropics. Our trip starts from Lago Deki and we are going up the Caucasus Ridge. We follow the ancient trail that runs through the North Caucasus. It was formerly the main artery connecting Dagestan and Lago Deki. Today, it is one of the most interesting tourist routes in Georgia, visited by many travelers. The trail follows the pristine nature. You can see the beautiful views of the Alazani Valley and the Caucasus Mountains at the same time. The camera and binoculars must be constantly ready. It is possible to meet rare representatives of the animal world at every step. Down the deciduous forest, there are many deer and noble deer. Wild pigs are abundant in the swamps. The trail enters maple groves, which means we have reached the subalpine zone. After the maples, a forest of birch trees bent from the snow begins. We approach the border of the Alpine zone. In the subalpine and alpine zones, there are chamois, and you can even spot wild goats here. The abundance of prey means that predators do not starve here either. In the Lago Deki forest, you will encounter wolves, bears, lynxes, foxes, forest cats, and martens. However, they do not pose a danger to the environment and only maintain balance and stability. We went through the birch forest and entered the evergreen rhododendron shrubland, meaning that we climbed to 2,300 meters above sea level. At 2,700 meters, the rhododendron also ended and the alpine meadows began. Here is the tourist territory their pasture. You can see the border of three states here. On the right, there is Azerbaijan, and in front of us, Russia. On the Alpine Plateau, several beautiful lakes from the glacial period are set into the rock like emeralds. There are islands woven from algae in the lakes. The largest is the Black Rock Lake, which is divided by the Russian-Georgian border. In the south, we constantly had a clear view of the Alazani Valley, changing colors throughout the day and turning red at sunset. 
Lago Deki, among other things, is a natural teaching laboratory. There are all the conditions for young people to learn about nature and master the rules of behavior in nature through outdoor school lessons. Another marvel of nature is the semi-desert just 30 kilometers from the subtropical forests of Lago Deki. There are harsh winters and unbearably hot summers and rain is extremely rare. This place is Vashlovani. Although Vashlovani is located between the two major Kakhetian rivers, the Iori and the Alazani, it is the driest and most waterless place in Georgia. Millions of years ago, there was an ocean floor here as evidenced by mollusks trapped in the rocks. As time went on, the sea dried up and a subtropical forest appeared in its place where elephant herds once roamed. There are no more elephants in Vashlovani today, although the green gold ridges and incense trees groves are very similar to African landscapes. The essential attribute of Vashlovani is the incense tree, the same as the wild pistachio. It grows very slowly and reaches five meters in height in a hundred years. Its lifespan is almost a thousand years. The grove of incense trees resembles an orchard in the distance. It seems that this is why this place is called Vashlovani or apple trees. The camera was aimed at the gazelles. However, the shot is full of insects. There are more than 700 species of insects in Vashlovani, which is why many species of birds do not suffer from food shortages here. The partridges you encounter here may not even think to take off. Swallow colonies nest on the steep clay plateaus Thus the name Swallow City. Vashlovani is an ideal place for bird observation. Here, you will see up to 60 species, griffin vultures, eagles, Egyptian vultures, storks, buzzards, great buzzards, and many more. This is a homeland for some birds and a wintering area for others. Unlike birds, the animals are cautious and more difficult to find. However, you may encounter a curious jackal along the way, or a rabbit may jump out from the bushes. The diversity of Vashlovani's wildlife can be clearly seen in the video cameras installed near the water. Bears, wolves, badgers, and pigs come to drink and cool off in the water. A lynx may also happen to be in the shot. The number of gazelles is increasing each year. There were thousands of gazelles in Georgia in the first half of the 20th century. Their habitat reached from Kaziki to Rustavi. There were many gazelles in the area of today's Tbilisi Sea. Then this species was completely wiped out because people thought that they competed with sheep. Today, thanks to human efforts, the gazelle is back in Vashlovani and feels at home. Between the village of Pirosmani and the village of Sabatlo in the Alazani floodplain, nature has created a real miracle. Here, the Alazani flows like a snake forming circles and shaping little peninsulas on both sides, part of which belongs to Azerbaijan and part to Georgia. One such peninsula is the Juma Bay or Kakliskure Walnut Bay with an area of about 200 hectares. It is surrounded by the Alazani and is connected to Georgian land only by a narrow entrance 15 to 20 meters wide. 
Juma Bay is, in fact, a field museum of natural history which makes it of special importance. This is the only place in Georgia where wild walnut trees grow. Here, we can find wild vines, wild quince, wild pomegranate, wild cherry, eastern crabapple, and others. That is, the trees with which our ancestors started agriculture. Boat trips on the Alazani are extremely attractive. The flooding, slow-flowing river and the beautiful floodplains abounding with birds will attract a lot of tourists. Adding to the charm of this route is the fact that the left bank is Azerbaijan and the right bank is Georgia. However, for this route to work, an agreement between the two countries is needed. This journey in history is coming to an end. However, we will see another landmark before our camera is turned off. In the valley of the Batsara River, there is a yew forest. Many of the trees have been here for a thousand years or more. Large yew groves are found nowhere else in the world, which makes this area our national treasure. Ranger Badri Tsiskarishvili leads us to see the oldest and most famous tree in Georgia. Researchers from different countries frequently visit to study it. The forest trail leads to the riverbank and then a steep ascent starts, and when we are all already exhausted, Badri lets us know we have reached the destination. Although the patriarch tree is nearly 2,000 years old, it still grows today and connects the country's past with its present. With this, we complete the tour of Eastern Georgia. In the next episode, we will continue our journey to Western Georgia, to the historical Kolkis, where it is observable how the Caucasus emerged from the water millions of years ago and how Georgia was created.